function, if you take this sine function and shift it up, you're going to lose the symmetry, right. right? If you shift it left or right, you'll keep the symmetry. If you shift it the right amount, does that make sense? With this, whatever. Okay, so there we go. It's going to be messed up. With this function, with cosine function, what happens if you shift it up? Does it lose its evenness? It doesn't, does it? Because it keeps that symmetry along the y-axis. So you can shift even functions up and keep their symmetry, but you can't shift odd functions up and keep their symmetry. Okay. Oh, I hate it when I forget to start. Okay. So then there are identities for negatives because of the even oddness. So if a function is even, so if f of x is even, what's true about f of negative x? It's just equal to f of x, right? And if a function f of x is odd, what happens when you plug in negative x? It's equal to negative fx. Uh-huh, it's equal to negative fx, okay? So evenness tells you that plugging in a negative number is the same as plugging in the positive number. And oddness tells you that the negative can come out of the function and sit out in front as like a negative one times the function. These two identities come from the even and oddness of sine and cosine. And you just apply this, this definition with f being cosine or sine. So cosine is the easier one. Cosine is even, right? So that means when you plug in negative x, it's the same thing as plugging in positive x. Do you see how that's just that definition with cosine instead of f? And that's because you can tell from the picture that cosine x is even. When you plug in pi, you get the same answer as plugging in negative pi. Does that make sense? Okay, odd. So what does oddness tell you about sine of negative x? How could you rewrite that? Negative sine x. Because it's odd, the negative can pull out. And that is just, you observe that they were even or odd from their pictures, and then that's just using what even and odd means in terms of functions to tell you, tell you that you can do that with them. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's why those identities are what they are. Um, the other identities you're going to know, some really, really important ones are the Pythagorean ones. Like, my students really, you really do have to have these memorized, but they come from the unit circle and the Pythagorean theorem. That's why they're called the Pythagorean entities. So think about inside of your unit circle. The sine and cosine are a point there on the unit circle, right? Like the first point is the cosine of your angle. The second point is the sine of your angle, right? Yeah. Definitely not. So there are some identities that you have to have memorized, and those I will not give you, but I will tell you what they are. Does that make sense? So there are a crap ton of trig identities, like lists and lists and lists. And of those identities, I can think of six you really have to know, like have memorized. And then there are some you be, must be able to like look at them and know that you can use them. So I'll give you a list of the ones I think you must recognize and just be able to use, but I will also have some that I will not give you because you must have them memorized. But I'll tell you what they are ahead of time. Does that make sense? As in, I'll give you a list and say, this is what you have to memorize, this is what you don't. And it's going to save your lives if you have them memorized next semester. I'm not trying to be a meanie, but there are certain things you have to know. I'm trying to teach you tricks to memorize them so it'll be faster. So the answer is no, I will not give you a list but, or not a full list. Okay, so for this thing, does it make sense that the x coordinate is the cosine, the y coordinate is the sine? What is the length of the hypotenuse there? One. Okay. And isn't this distance cosine? And isn't that distance sine? So doesn't cosine of that theta squared plus sine of that theta squared equal one squared from the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, and this thing where the squared is written like that, that means sine of the whole thing squared. Does calling them x's or thetas really matter at all? No. So what does sine squared plus cosine squared have to equal? One. 
And that's one you certainly have to have memorized. Okay. And that would be true even if you were sort of like over in this quadrant as well, wouldn't it? The cosine would be negative, but you would square it, which makes it positive, right? And just a thing to know, so cosine squared x, that means cosine x, the whole thing squared. If I write this, what does that mean? Yeah, it means cosine of x times x. You see how those are actually going to be different things? I think that's the reason that they chose to use this notation, because otherwise if you forget the parentheses, it's not clear what you mean. Okay, so there are two more Pythagorean, uh, Pythagorean identities, and your book doesn't actually go over them yet, but I think it's appropriate to do that now. So we're going to take this identity we have up above, and we're going to divide it by cosine squared. So divide this side by cosine squared x and this side by cosine squared x. Does that make sense that this is the same thing as sine squared x over cosine squared x plus cosine squared x over cosine squared x equals 1 over cosine squared x? Okay. And all I want you to do now is rewrite those things using different names. What is sine over cosine? Tangent. Tangent. So that's tangent squared x. What is cosine squared divided by itself? 1. So tangent squared x plus 1 equals. And what is 1 over cosine? Secant. Yep. So the new identity is tangent squared x plus 1 equals secant squared x. Does that make sense? Do the same thing, divide by sine squared, you're going to get a different one. So see if you can figure out what it is. Take the whole basic identity, the sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals 1, and divide both sides by sine squared, and you're going to get a new one. So see if you can figure out what it is. get it? So what's sine squared over sine squared? 1 plus, how about cosine over sine? Cotangent. Cotangent equals 1 over sine squared, which is cosecant. See, cosecant squared. So just FYI, those three are definitely three you're going to have to have memorized. But it's a lot better to memorize where they come from as opposed to just like what they are like randomly. Does that make sense? The first one's the Pythagorean theorem. That's really all it is, right? We're going to use it so often you're going to be like, okay, yeah, sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. Got that. And the other ones you say, okay, well, I know I get secant squared by dividing by cosine squared. And I know I get cosecant squared by dividing by sine squared. And that's, so it's not that bad. All right. So... Using the even-odd identities that we know, tell me whether these functions are even-odd or neither. So the way you check for even-odd or neither is you plug in negative x and you see what comes out, right? That's how you check. When I say stuff like show your work, that's what I mean. You have to show that step. So tangent of negative x. And you say, well, I know about the even and oddness of sine and cosine, right? Does that make sense? So tangent is sine over cosine. So tangent of negative x is sine of negative x over cosine of negative x, right? OK. 
and sine is odd. So what is sine of negative x equal to? Negative sine, negative sine x. Cosine is even. What is cosine of this the same? And then isn't sine over cosine just tangent, right? So that's just negative tan x. So tangent is odd. Is that what you suspected from its picture? You think its picture has asymptotes at positive pi halves, negative pi halves, and looks like this, right? Does that look like an odd function? Mm -hmm. It does, yeah. Um, why, what would have happened, if this didn't happen in this question, but what would happen if two negatives would have come out? We would have made a positive, which would have meant it was an even function, right? So when you have like a function that becomes odd and it's a ratio, the negative's in one place, not both. Does that make sense? It's in the numerator or denominator, not both. Okay. How about this function? Cosine of, neg of x over x. So plug in negative x. That gives you cosine of negative x over negative x. So can you conclude anything about the cosine of negative x? It's just cosine x. It's just cosine x. And then you have that divided by negative x. It's obviously not the original function, right? But it is the same thing as negative the original function, isn't it? So that's negative f of x. So what kind of function is this? Also odd. What if that denominator would have been x squared? Then you would have had a positive in the bottom and it would have made the function into an even function. Okay? And I think a qu good question is what is neither going to look like? Because that's the trickiest one, I think, of these. Even's the easiest because when you plug negative x and you just could get the original function out, right? Odd is, neither is the easiest. So let's plug in negative x. So that's negative x minus sine of negative x plus 1. That plus 1 doesn't change because nothing gets plugged in there. Does that make sense? The change is the same, plus 1, because I didn't originally have that there. Okay, so this is negative x minus negative sine x plus 1. So negative x plus sine x plus 1. So question, does this equal the original function? No. no, so it's not even. Does it equal negative the original function? No. Not quite, right? What messes it up? Yes. That plus one. So it doesn't equal the function, it doesn't equal the original function times negative one, and that means it's mm -hmm. neither. Yep, technically speaking, the x sine x component is an odd function, and then it's been shifted up. So that's one way to mess up an odd mess up a function and make it neither. Another way something could be neither, let's do just one more. Just add it in the margin or something. Let's do, how about sine x plus cosine x? So when you plug in negative x, that's sine of negative x plus cosine of negative x. So the negative can pull out of the sine. What happens with the negative and the cosine? Cancels. It cancels away, goes, becomes cosine of x. And is that the original function? No. Is it negative the original function? No. So one way to mess up and make an either function is to add a constant to an odd function. Another way is to add even and odd functions together. The original, oh no, good question. Sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals one when you square. But if you square root that whole side, it's a common mistake, it happens all the time. That's gonna equal one. Can the um, square root square root the sine and cosine individually? Square roots distribute over addition? No. Okay, so nope, this does not equal one. When it's squared, it does. Okay. 
All right, a couple other identities you have to memorize are these, but you kind of already know them. What is tangent equal to? Oh, even easier than that. So that's tangent squared. So just plain old tangent, like in terms of sine or cosine. Sine over cosine. And cotangent is uh -huh, cosine over sine. It's the, it's the opposite, the reciprocal. Okay. What I'll because there's lots of ways to express tangent. Like technically speaking, there was the we had the identity that was tangent squared x plus one equals secant squared. You could say okay, tangent squared x equals secant squared x minus one. So tangent x equals plus or minus the square root of that stuff. Like that's actually not wrong. Does that make sense? Um, so I will have to be pretty clear about what I'm looking for so, or, uh, in the direction. So like if I ask for a question like this, I'll tell you, give me tangent and cotangent in terms of sine and cosine. Does that make sense? Because technically that's also a true statement. And if you give me a true statement and I haven't been clear in what I wanted, I can't really like be mad at you for it. Okay. So graph the following functions, find the period, domain, range, symmetry, describe the behavior. So we'll just do this page and then we'll finish the rest next time. Okay, so we've already graphed this today because that just happened. What, where are tangents asymptotes? At the half pies, yep. At half pi and negative half pi. And it goes through 0, 0. At pi quarters, it's at 1. At negative pi quarters, it's at negative 1. Bam, there's one cycle, right? And then you just take that cycle, and if you only had a copy-paste function in your pencil, right? So we'll just graph one more. Where is the next cycle going to end? Three pi halves. In the middle, it's pi. Positive one, negative one. There you go. Okay. So find the period, domain, range, and symmetry. Let's just do the domain first. So for the domain, just give me a completely comprehensive list of the things that x cannot equal. Great, plus or minus, and then, and then you can just say dot, dot, dot. Okay, I'll get that you get that there's a pattern there. The range, does this function have a lowest or a highest? No. no. So the range is all real numbers. Okay, the symmetry is symmetric about the origin. origin. We already proved that it's odd, right? And then the period, how long is one cycle in this case? How far is it from negative pi halves to pi halves? So you go half a pi and another half pi, right? The length of the cycle is actually pi. Okay, I think we haven't actually graphed cotangent today, have we? We graphed it in the last lesson, so let's graph this cotangent function. So cotangent of x. Cotangent, like we said, is cosine over sine. Where will this function have its asymptotes? Sine is 0 at 0, right? And then again at pi, right? So it'll have its first asymptote at the y-axis next one at pi, then it's going to have it at 2 pi. I think it'll actually be useful to like plug in some numbers. We've got oh, 1, 0, dyslexia, root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2, and then 0, 1. Okay. So when you plug in pi halves, does everybody agree that taking the x divided by the y is going to give us 0? You buy that? 
And the question is, is does this function increase or does it decrease within the little subinterval? And so you can plug in a number to figure it out. So this is pi halves, what's halfway to pi halves? Pi fourths. And that one's pretty easy because doing the x divided by the y, since the x and y are equal, they'll be pretty easy, right? So what is pi halves divided by pi halves going to give you? One. One. And then after pi halves is three pi quarters, right? That's not quite all the way to pi, which is the point over here. And that's negative root two over two, positive root two over two. And if you do the cosine divided by the sine, what does that give you? Negative one. Negative one. So you see it has the same general shape as that tangent picture. It's just that it's sort of reflected in some sense, right? And the way you figure out which way it goes is you revert to your unit circle and just divide some numbers. It's really not that bad. And then once you've got one pattern, you can just copy paste the rest. Domain, range, symmetry, and then we'll be done. So just be very careful with this one. Students tend to say, okay, x can't be plus or minus pi, plus or minus 2 pi, which is not wrong, but they've just left one number out. Don't forget about 0, because if you do, I've got to take off like a point. So I don't want to, I just have to, because you didn't set, you don't know, you meant, I'm sure you'd get it, but, you know, whatever. Um, did the range change? No. no. Negative infinity to infinity. Okay, symmetry. I think it's not quite as obvious here, but think if you took this thing and you rotated it, this part that's above the x-axis is going to rotate and land on that part that's below, and this part that's below is going to flip and land up on the stuff that's above. You can prove it by plugging in negative x and showing that you have an odd function. This is symmetric about the origin. It is an odd function. Oh, yeah, 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 you can put the all real number symbol, of course. Yep, yep, yep. And the period, how long is one cycle of this function? Pi. Pi. Okay, so I think that worked out well. We'll finish this 6-4 tomorrow. And so what are the, what is the definition of cosecant in terms of sine and cosine? Like, how do you write that with a sine or cosine in it? One, one over sine. Great. And if you just know that, you're better off than half of my calculus students I had last semester in the fall. Just like know that that's what it is. A secant will be one over cosine. One over cosine. And <coughs> excuse me, cotangent you can express two ways. You can express this as one over tangent. Or what's the other way that you know? Cosine over sine. Cosine over sine. <coughs> The reason that's true, you don't write this down, but just look at it. Tangent is sine over cosine, right? So you've got one over sine over cosine. Does that make sense? And then to get that cosine out of the denominator's denominator, you multiply by cosine x over one and cosine x over one, right? That's how it gives you back cosine over sine. But they're called, and why, why are they called the reciprocal identities? <clears throat> what is there, what, what's the reciprocal of two? One half. You see how it's you know one over something? Okay. Alrighty. So graphing these is definitely the trickiest. So we're gonna start with secant. Secant is one over cosine. So the first thing you do is graph <clears throat> cosine of x. On the quiz that I'm giving you guys tomorrow, or, well, Samanea is giving you tomorrow, I put grid lines in there so you don't have to worry about trying to draw straight lines. I also put tick marks on them, okay? So, because it makes me nuts, and I assume it makes other people crazy. So, <clears throat> you are going to have to graph every single function tomorrow. Like, I'm warning you now, okay? Sine, cosine, tangent, cos cotangent, cosecant, and secant. You must produce those graphs at least once. Um, <clears throat> So the way you graph cosine is you start with your unit circle, 
And you find all the easy points, which are the points on the axes. So this point right there, the first one, is the point 1, 0. <clears throat> What's the point on the y-axis going counterclockwise? Very good. Uh, what is the point keeping going counterclockwise? <clears throat> yep. And then the bottom point is 0, negative 1, right? Okay. It takes cosine 2 pi to go through its cycle. So ends at 2 pi. It's halfway at pi. There's pi halves. What's halfway between pi and 2 pi? 3 pi halves. Great. And on your unit circle, which coordinates are the cosines? <clears throat> the x's or the y's? The x's. They're alphabetical. It's super helpful. So at an angle of 0, your cosine is 1. one. At an angle of pi halves, which is up at 90, what's your cosine? Mm -hmm. By pi, you're at mm -hmm. 3 pi, you're at 0, right? And 2 pi, you're back at 1 again. <coughs> to make it easier to see the symmetry, that's why I put my axis in the middle. I want to graph the other half, too. Does that make sense? Go backwards. So back to negative 2 pi. Here's negative pi, negative pi halves, negative 3 pi halves. So it'd go 0, negative 1, 0, 1. Each cycle corresponds to 5 points. Does that make sense as well? Okay, so sketch. That's your cosine picture. Everyone got the cosine picture? Okay. That really, cosine and cosine themselves are most important ones. You really know what the graphs of, then comes tangent, and then the rest of them are either less important, but it's good to have seen them. So we are going to do one divided by cosine. Where is this function, this secant function, going to have vertical asymptotes? At the half pies, exactly. So three half pies, uh, pi halves, negative pi halves, positive pi halves, and three pi halves. Whenever the graph of cosine is zero or crosses the x-axis, that's where your function is going, your secant function will have an asymptote. Okay, and then for these dots, the ones that are at the whole number multiples of pi, they all have y-coordinates of one, right? Doing one divided by one makes one, so they're all one, so you know you've got those points. And then as you, say, go down towards zero, the values of the cosine get smaller, right? So one divided by them gets bigger. And you get this kind of like parabola-ish pattern in between the asymptotes. And that would just keep going forever and ever and ever in both directions. Okay. So then find the period, domain, range, symmetry, describe the behavior. So domain. Let's start with that. Just give me a list of the stuff that x cannot be. Any half pies. Yep, plus or minus pi halves, plus or minus three pi halves, etc. Technically, any half pies is almost is a little bit wrong. It's not like bad. I can because I know what you mean. But technically speaking, pi is also a half pi because it could be written as two over two pi. Does that make sense? So it's any odd half pi. Does that make sense? Okay, awesome. Just don't forget the plus minus in the list. Now the range. We're looking at the pink thing pink, red. 
So is there a lowest y value that comes out? Negative infinity, yep. Yeah. And then those like lower red bits, what's, wh when do they top out? Negative one. negative one. And then there's a big old gap from negative one to one. When do they start again? One, and then they go up to infinity. How about symmetry? What kind of function is this? Is it symmetric about the y-axis, origin, or neither? Y-axis, so it's even. Okay, and the last thing was to find the period. So the period is the length of, say, like, one complete part of the graph that you can then like tessellate to get the rest. You guys know what tessellation is? I'm just like kind of copy paste. It comes from geometry. So the point, question I have is, is this like just bottom half the complete pattern only or the top half the complete pattern? The complete pattern has to include both the top and the bottom. Does that make sense? So how far is it from negative pi halves to three pi halves? Two pi, I think, right? Does that make sense? Because one half, two half, three half, four half. Four half is two pi. Does that make sense? Okay. So the period in this case, or the length of one cycle, is two pi. Because these pictures extend in infinite directions, when I ask you to graph them on quizzes and tests, I'm going to have to give you a specific interval to graph them on, or say like two cycles. But it makes it so much easier if I give you an interval, so I'm going to give you intervals. Does that make sense? I'll say, like, oh, from negative 2 pi to pi, 2 pi. Yeah. So what would we do for that Say that again? What would we do for that end behavior? <laughs> end behavior, yeah. So, hmm, doesn't really have any, right? Yeah. So I don't know what they mean by, I don't know what this, I copied this from your textbook, and I'm not even sure what they mean by describe the behavior. It's really weird. Don't worry about it for this case, because there really isn't any end behavior, because it goes, you know, it goes to infinity, but then all of a sudden you pass, and that's when it changes and goes to negative infinity. So there is no clear end behavior. Okay. So that's how you graph secant. Let's try and I'll graph cosecant. So cosecant is 1 over sine x. So we're going to start by graphing the sine function. And in the unit circle, that's like a perfect circle. Nobody's impressed. OK, get it. Tough crowd. 1, 0, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, 0, negative 1. OK, here's 2 pi, negative 2 pi. Okay, so for the sine function, you take all of the y coordinates. What is sine of zero? Zero. Mm -hmm. How about sine of um, sine of pi halves? One. One. Pi. Zero. Uh, three pi halves. Negative one. Two pi. Zero. Okay. Hello. The great thing about giving you grids that are evenly spaced is your pictures are actually going to look right. Yay! I know, right? Okay, where where is this particular graph going to have all those vertical asymptotes? At all the all, all the whole number pies. Yep. And zero. Yep. Technically, zero is a whole number pi because it's zero pi. That's that's just the sad pi because you don't have any pi. You're hungry. And then it's the exact same pattern as before, right? You have these sort of like parabola-shaped things that are stuck in between their asymptotes. I mean, for the same reasons.
So when you write down what x cannot equal for this particular example, just don't forget 0. So 0, and then what else? Plus minus? Mm -hmm, plus minus 2 pi, and then, you know, etc. Is the range of this function any different than the range from cosecant? Yes. If you can do this without graphing the sine function first, that's totally fine. Yep. Because also what I'm going to ask you to do in the test is graph the sine function in a different question as well. Does that make sense? So yeah, you totally can. Yep. The range is negative infinity to negative 1, union 1 to infinity. <clears throat> The symmetry, is it an even function? No, but is it an odd function? Is this one harder to visualize, but I think if you take this and you like go, whomp, make the noise, it'll help a lot. Will it land back on itself? Yeah. I think it will. Like if you flip this, it goes kind of like over this axis first and then down. It, this part will land on that. This part will rotate way around and land on down, you go up, right? I'm perfectly happy there without imagining a sine function as a pinwheel. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. So, odd. Um, what is the length of one cycle for this function? 2 pi. Great. <clears throat> All right. So some other stuff. So this is a quest. This is the kind of stuff you're going to actually encounter a lot in calculus. So you're going to solve equations that have sine and cosine in them. And there are, say, like calculators that will find some of these answers for you. But the point is, is like, can you figure? There are certain ways you'll be able to figure out without actually having to um, use a calculator. And that's when you get values that are on your unit circle. So this question says to find the smallest positive theta in degree and radian measure for which the following equations are true. Okay, so the first one says that sine of theta is equal to negative 3 halves. If you have a unit circle in front of you, you can look at it, but the thing is you're not always going to have your unit circle with you. You've got to have ways to deal with it and to have it be quick. I, I just re, I just redraw with the uh, first uh, with the, the first quadrant values. Yeah, let's just redraw the part you need. So here's like a little bit of unit circle. The sine is the y coordinate, right? So if your sine is negative root three over two, which quadrants do you have to be in right off the bat? Quadrant two. The sine is the y, which means your point had to go up or down. 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 So you have to be in this quadrant, or you've got to be in that quadrant. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's obviously not one of the ones on the axis because at those points the sine is either 0 or 1, right? Okay. So then your options are it's this middle angle that's a pi quarters. What are the coordinates at that point in the middle? Uh huh. Negative root 2 over 2, negative root 2 over 2. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, then you have two other options. One option is that triangle, where the little angle in there is 30 degrees. What's the other option? This angle, and then what's the little angle inside that triangle? 60. I really should have drawn that bigger, shouldn't I? Okay. There you go. So here's the root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2, both of them negative. Okay. In this triangle, where this is the 30 degree angle, what is the length of that side, the up and down side? That's one half. Does that make sense? Because it's the smaller side because it's opposite the smaller angle. What's the length of this side? root 3 over 2. Okay, so using that information, what are the coordinates at that point down there? What's the x? Negative 1 half. Negative root 3 over 2. The x is actually negative root 3 over 2. 
and the y is negative one half. Because when you graph a point, how far over you go horizontally is the x. That's the side to side part. And then the rest of it, the up and down part, the y is the the y is the up and down part. Okay. So at that angle, what is the sign? Negative one half. So it's not negative root three over two. Okay, how about this angle? Do you see how it's the same triangle except for the 60 degree angle is now right there? What's this little angle right here? Going to be 30. And so then what is the length of that side now? One half. One half. And what is the length of the vertical side? Root 3 over 2. So this point has coordinates negative one half, negative root three over two. So is the sine negative root three over two at that angle? Yes. Yes. Okay, so that's the angle you're looking for. It says the small positive. Yes. And so you just figure out what that is. Like how many degrees is it? Say that again. It says smallest positive theta, but I see what your problem is. Okay. The y coordinate is negative, but the angle that produces that y coordinate is a positive angle. So what they mean is how many degrees does it take you to get to that point? So it's 180 plus an additional 60, which is 240. What they're trying to say then is they want you to give 240. What they don't want you to do is they don't want you to give negative 120 as an answer. Do you see what I mean? And the fact that the sign equals a negative number means you have to be in either this quadrant or this quadrant. And we went with the third quadrant because it has a less of an We went with the third quadrant because they said they want the smallest positive theta. And this would happen again in this quadrant. What would be the next angle where, like this next point? That's going to be the point positive 1 half negative root 3 over 2, right? So it also has a sign of negative root 3 over 2. It's an additional how many degrees? 30. 60. 60, I think, because it's 30 to the axis and then 30 more. Yeah. So that would be 300, right? Mm -hmm. But notice they said they find the smallest positive theta. Yeah. So basically they're saying find the first one that you encounter. Um, what would that have been in radians? What's 240 in radians? Hmm, okay, so well, if you can count it out, this is, this is pi, right? So it's 6 pi 6, 7 pi 6, 8 pi 6, 4 pi thirds. So what they want you to do is just give you the measurement in both the degree and the radian system. Okay, cosine of theta equals 1. When is the first time that this happens? At 0, right? Because that's the point 1 comma 0, and cosine is the x, right? So theta equals 0 degrees or 0 radians. Now, one thing that I'm actually not positive about because I'm not sure how technical they're going to be, zero is a neither positive nor negative number. So just in case they're being really, really picky about that, you'd say, okay, the first positive time it happens is 2 pi or 360 degrees. I don't personally, me don't care, but if a like, system like Alex is being picky, that might be what they're after, okay? Uh, it might be looking for 2 pi and 360 because 0 is not a positive number. 0 is one of those neithers. Does that make sense? I mean, it's, it's silly. I get it. Okay. How about the sine being root 2 over 2? What quadrants would that happen in? 1. 1. And also 2, right? Because that's the y. But the first place it happens is in quadrant 1, right? So what angle does that correspond to? 45 degrees, which in radians is the same thing as pi over 4. So 
In my experience with trigonometry in the unit circle, the easiest points are the ones that land on an axis, other than dyslexia. Does that make sense? And then what are the next easiest points? Fourth. The fourth, because the y and x are the same at those points except for up to some kind of sign flip because you're in a certain quadrant, right? And then these ones that are the 36 degrees of the neck, they're the hardest ones because you've got to keep, you have to not flip them. But let's try another. So tangent of theta equals 1. I'll draw a big old unit circle. And tangent isn't quite as obvious because you don't actually have tangent listed on that circle, right? But if you think tangent is sine divided by cosine, and if something divided by something else has got to equal 1, what's got to be true about those two things? They're going to be the same. Yeah, this is going to imply that sine theta is going to have to equal cosine theta. And so that happens at this point because both sine and cosine are root 2 over 2. Where else does it happen? In the third, In the third quadrant, they're both negative. So what is the smallest possible theta in positive measure for which this occurs? 45 degrees, yep, or pi quarters. Okay, and then tangent being root 3, well, hmm. Okay. What are the coordinates at that first angle? You go over root 3 over 2, right? And up how much? One half. one half. Which means the next point is just the opposite, right? The other one is 1 half root 3 over 2. Okay. Obviously, that one, this tangent thing is going to be one of those two, right? The question is just which one. So taking sine divided by cosine means you do y divided by x or x divided by y? y divided by x. Y divided by x. So if you do 1 half over root 3 over 2, you get 1 over root 3, right? Those over 2s don't really matter. If you do the other one, what do you get? Over 2 over a half, and then what happens to the 1 halves? They cancel. So which angle were you looking for, the first or second one? The second one. Um, so that is an angle of theta equals 60 degrees, right? Or how many radians? Mm -hmm. 1 over 3. Well, pi over 3. You know, pi is the new one. Okay. Secant being root 2, what kind of angle do you suspect that that comes from? Is it a 30 or 60, or is it a 45? 45. Probably a 45, because those are the ones that involve root 2 somehow, right? The question is how. And so you say, OK, well, I know secant b negative root 2 is the same thing as saying 1 over cosine equals negative root 2, which is the same thing as saying 1 equals negative root 2 times cosine. Does that make sense? or negative 1 over root 2 equals cosine. So far, so good. Or if you rationalize that denominator, you get negative root 2 over 2 equals cosine. Does that make sense what I did there? So I started by making secant and a 1 over cosine. I multiplied the cosine over, OK? Divided by root 2, right? and then multiply this by root 2 over root 2 to make it in the form that I know, okay? So looking for where secant equals negative root 2 is the same as looking for where cosine is negative root 2 over 2. So which quadrants is cosine negative in? Two. And also 3, right? But 2 is the first one. So this is the point that you're looking for. Because at that point, the coordinates are negative root 2 over 2, positive root 2 over 2. And so what angle is that? I think it's 135. Because it's, it's 90 degrees plus an additional 45. Oh, oh, I thought you were looking for the one half. Oh, you, yeah, no, it's root 2 over 2. Because 
I had secant equaling root 2. I think maybe what you lost is at this stage, when I have that 1 over root 2, what you do is you multiply by square root 2 over square root 2. So the numerator is still a square root, because 1 times root 2 is still root 2. Um, what is the degree, or the radian measure, sorry? 3 pi quarters. 3 pi quarters, yep. So 3 pi quarters. Okay. Usually, you don't only find the one or the first one. Usually, you find sort of like all of the numbers that work within a specific interval. Like for this last example, we found just this one when technically this one also is an angle that produces the same answer. That's what example six is asking you. It's saying find all the thetas in between zero and two pi that give you a sine of theta equaling one half. So look at a big unit circle. So first thing is figure out which quadrants you're in. Sine is the y coordinate. Which quadrants do you have to be in? One and two. Yep. And it's either this angle or this angle. So what are the coordinates at that first angle? The x is root 3 over 2. The y is 1 half, right? Then you've got the root 2 over 2s. It's not that one. What are the coordinates at the next one? Uh-huh. Yep, exactly. So which one of those angles has the sine being 1 half? The first one. What angle is that? 30 or pi over 6. Since they specified to be between 0 and 2 pi, that's specifying that you have to use radians. The next time that happens is over in this quadrant. And that point has coordinates negative root 3 over 2, positive 1 half. So what angle is that? 5 pi over 6. Are there any more places between 0 and 2 pi where the sine is going to be positive? Nope. So those two only. Oh, look. We already did the work for part B. I want to find where the cosine is negative root 3 over 2. Look at one of them is what? I think it's 5 pi over 6. Right? Right here. Okay. And the next one, what quadrant's gonna what quadrant will it be in? Third. So it'll be down there. That has coordinates negative root 3 over 2, negative 1 half. Okay, and how many is that? This is 6 pi 6. Next is 7 pi 6. It's 1 pi 6 past pi. Okay. And we already kind of did tangent of theta equals 1. What's 1 theta that makes that happen? Pi over... 4. Mm -hmm. That's this one right here because the sine and cosine are both root 2 over 2. What's the other one? 5 pi over 4, right? Because they're both the sine and cosine are both negative root 2 over 2. So one thing that happened in my calculus classes, or one thing that happens in math classes in general, you have tests that are timed, right? And you have to like kind of decide what to do with your time. Does that make sense? So I had students who would try to draw an entire unit circle and fill out the entire thing, which was a bad use of time because they might not have needed the entire thing. Does that make sense? So only draw the portions that you actually need. Does that make sense? So not to fill an entire unit circle. Uh, unless you're required to fill an entire unit circle on like a quiz that you're going to get. But after that point in time, I probably won't make you fill an entire unit circle because like... You, you won't have to. And it's, the question is, can you figure it out without having to like have the whole crutch there? Okay, tangent theta equals negative 1. So if tangent of theta equals negative 1, the sine and cosine must be the same, but they must have opposite signs. As in one must be positive and one must be negative. So that's going to be this one and this one. Right? 
What's the first angle there? 3 pi over 4. What's the next one? Very good. How far apart are they? Like how many pies do you have to travel to get from one to the next? One whole pie. Does that make sense? Half of half the way around the circle. Okay, I find cosecant and secant so much easier to deal with if I change them back into sines and cosines. So we know cosecant is one over sine, right? At least you're gonna know that. So one will equal negative two times sine of theta. And so sine theta equals, mm -hmm. so solving cosecant equals negative two is the same as solving sine of theta is negative one half. Ooh, so what quadrants are we looking at? Bottoms. Bottoms, yep. And you're either looking at this one or this one. So what are the coordinates at that first point? The, no. The coordinate's not the angle. The coordinate is, the, what is the x-coordinate there? How far back do you go? Uh-huh. And how far down do you go? Great. And this one is negative one-half, negative root three over two. Okay. So which angle gives a sign of negative one-half? The first one, exactly. So the theta would be, how many pi six is that? Seven. Seven pi over six. And knowing that it's this one means that it also has to be this one over here, right? That's one pi six shy of all the way there. So how many pi six is that? Eleven. Eleven pi six. Sorry, I'll move that up in case you can't see it. Okay, and then the last one. Let's figure out where does secant equal root two. Well, that's one over cosine of theta equals root two. So cosine theta equals, wait, sorry, that's one equals root two times cosine theta. So one over root two equals cosine of theta. So if you rationalize the denominator, you're looking for where cosine of theta equals what? Radical 2 over 2. And that will be this angle. So theta is pi over, uh-huh. And also this angle. So theta is, oh, it's not that angle. No, that's wrong. It's totally wrong. This one right here. Yeah, how many pi over 4 is that? 7. I was just checking if you were awake. Because it's early and you got to do that sometimes. Okay. So if you were to take that x coordinate and that y coordinate and square them and add them together, what's going to happen? You're going to get one. Because this makes a triangle whose hypotenuse is 1, right? And as long as you're on the, on the unit circle, if you take the x-coordinate squared plus the y-coordinate squared, you get 1, right? That's that Pythagorean identity that said cosine squared x plus sine squared x equals 1 always, which we discussed earlier in this lesson. So suppose that theta is an angle that's in standard position whose terminal side intersects the unit circle at the point 9 41st and 40 41st. It's some weird number and some weird angle. So how do you know what quadrant it's in? So the x is positive and the y is positive, right? Mm -hmm. Which means you go over some little bit and up some little bit, right? That means you've got to be in quadrant number one. Does that make sense? And they tell you that it's on the unit circle. How could you verify that it was on the unit circle if you had to? You could, do the you could square it, right? You could verify it and say, okay, well, if I do 9 over 41 and I square that, 
and I add 40 over 41, and I swear that you should get out one, like you will. So okay, so the point is 9 over 41 and 40 over 41. Tell me what the sign is, even not knowing the angle. 40 over 41. Right, I mean, it's the, what they're trying to get at there is that sign is the y coordinate, right? Does that make sense? It's just that this is not one of the common angles that were on the sheet that on the unit circle, that's all. What would cosine be at that point? Nine, Nine over 41, exactly. Um, secant, that would be the reciprocal of cosine, right? So 41 over 9. Okay. So the point is, is this is how you would deal with stuff that's on the unit circle, but it's just not a common thing that you were already given. It's, but the x coordinate is the cosine and the y coordinate is the sine. That's all. And the thing that they said, the, what they're saying is standard position. They mean that you haven't gone around the circle like repeatedly. Okay. So... The next thing is just a little bit of vocabulary. The acute angle formed by the terminal side of theta and the x-axis is called the reference angle. So what this tells you is how far away from the x-axis you are. It's always taken to be positive. So, for example, okay, so if I gave you the angle theta equaled, we'll say, 5 pi 6. That is over here, right? It's almost all the way to the x-axis, right? How much farther do you have to go to get to the x-axis? Pi over 6. That is, the that is the reference angle, okay? So in this case, the reference angle is equal to pi 6. If I'd given you the angle theta equals negative 5 pi 6, how would that differ from the angle that I drew? So I went counterclockwise for the first one, right? So for negative 5 pi 6, I go clockwise. And the reference angle is how far away are you from the x-axis? And how far away are you from the x-axis for, for that thing? How much farther do I have to go around counterclockwise to get to it? pi over 6. So it's the same thing. Does that idea make sense? So it's saying, like, how can you get to the x-axis most quickly? And it's always taken to be a positive number. So, and here's a list. Negative 13 pi over 15. So will this angle be all the way to the x-axis? No. So and the reason is, is that going all the way like a full backwards pi would be 15 pi over 15. Does that make sense? So negative 13 pi over 15, it's about like this. How much farther do you have to go to get to the x-axis? 2 pi over 15. So why is it positive rather than negative? Positive, it's just a definition. It's always taken to be positive. I agree with your some, your, your um, analysis that really they probably should have defined this to be negative two pi fifteenths because that specifies you keep going in the same direction. I don't know why. Okay, but the reference angle is always a positive angle. It's just the definition of what it is. So, yeah, it is, and it's also just kind of saying how much more distance do I have to go. I think that might be what it, what they're getting at. It might actually be referencing a distance. And definitions of distances is that they must be positive. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's my, that's my guess. And, I mean, I don't think there's any reason to think about it too much other than it, it is always positive and just deal with it. Negative 252. Holy moly. Okay. So let's see. So that goes a hun negative 180. And then how much past it does it go? 72. You can figure that out by doing 252 minus 180. Does that make sense? That tells you how much further it's going to go. It goes an additional 72 degrees, or an additional negative 72 degrees. 
So how far do you have to go to get back to the x-axis or to the x-axis in the closest possible manner? 72. Does that make sense? So in, this, for in the first case, you undershot it, and it's how much additional do you have to go, right? In the second case, you overshot the x-axis. How much did you do extra? And how you ask yourself what angle to pick is you say, OK, well, which one's less degrees going backwards or going forwards? Does that make sense? So that's what a reference angle is. It's not going to come up a lot. You have to kind of know what they are. I think what they're getting at is when you find values of sines and cosines within specific, like the unit circle, it's helpful to know like how much pi you are past an axis. That's what thing that this is supposed to really get at for you guys. So it's not very hard. It's always positive. Moving on. Yes. There, no. Let me do one more. What if I gave you theta was 192, okay? It's a good question. I should have done one positive one as well. The reason that those two went counterclockwise is because they were negative angles. Does that make sense? So 192 is going to go forwards, right? How much past 180 will it go? 12. 12. So an additional 12 degrees past 180. So in that case, what is the reference angle? Mm -hmm. You overshot it by 12. Yep. OK, awesome. Now the next question is, I don't know if you guys did, if you guys saw one that's easy. Did when, so we're going to do the same thing kind of where we have a hypotenuse that's not one, where we have just, we're given a point, and we want to find the sine, cosine, and cotangent at that point. So where will the point negative 2, 3 fall? Which quadrant? Third. Yep, we'll go back 2 and down 3. So this side is 2, this side is 3. How would you figure out the length of the hypotenuse? Pythagorean theorem. Yep. Negative 2 squared plus negative 3 squared will equal c squared. Uh, 4 plus 9. What? You must be sleeping this morning. No, yeah, it's 13. Yeah, c squared <laughs> equals 13. So c is root 13. So that side is square root of 13. And that's the angle theta. And what we're going to do there to find sine of theta and cosine of theta and all those other things is we're just going to use the fact that sine takes the y-coordinate of that triangle and then divides by the hypotenuse. So what is the y-coordinate there? The 2 or the 3? The 3, and it would be negative because it's down, right? And then the hypotenuse, you divide by radical 13. That just scales it down so it'll end up in the unit circle. So, and if, I'm not sure if Alex will make you do this, but they might make you rationalize that as negative 3 root 13 over 13. Yes, yes they do. They do? Okay. So, just FYI. Do you, you know how I got that? Okay. Personally, I don't really care, but, I mean, if they make you rationalize, it's fine. Okay, cosecant of theta, that will be 1 over sine, right? Yes? Sorry, I'm missing So the other definition you can do for sine and cosine, if you don't have a unit circle, is sine can be taken as the y-coordinate in that triangle divided by the hypotenuse. It's just that in our unit circle, the hypotenuse was always 1, and so that definition is the same thing. That's all. If I'd asked you to find cosine, what would it have been? 2. Adjacent? Well, don't think, don't think adjacent. Think it, don't think. You've got you to drop Sokotoa for a second. Hey, you've got to think x. Cosine is x. So, yep, so it'd be a 2, and we'd be negative because it's backwards, right? Over the root 13. Okay. 
I know Sokoto has been drilled in so hard, it's like ingrained, you can't get rid of it. Okay, how, what would one over sine be then? It'd be the reciprocal of that. Which one do you want to reciprocate, the first or second one? First. First one, I think, yeah. Does it matter which place the negative goes? Nope. Nope. Okay. And cotangent of theta, that will be cosine over sine. So the cosine would be, like we said, negative 2 over root 13. What's the sine going to be? Well, we, negative 3 over root 13. What happens to them root 13s? They go away, and so do the negatives, right? And you get 2 thirds. Okay, so... Some teachers teach the unit circle. Don't write this down, just look at it. They don't always do it the way that I do it. So sometimes the teachers use triangles and they say, okay, well, in that 30, 60, 90 triangle, they say, okay, well, this is two. If this was 60, then this side is one and this side is root. Anybody, anybody teachers do it that way instead? Yeah. Okay. So. And they said, oh, well, if you want to find cosine of, say, 60 degrees, you take the x-coordinate, which is 1 half, is 1 divided by the y-coordinate, which is 2. Does that make sense? You're going to get the same answers if you do it that way. But you see what they're doing is they're saying, okay, well, I just take the x side, which is the cosine, and I divide it by the hypotenuse. In the cases where I was doing it, you could do it that way too, but it's kind of redundant because this side was one half, and what was the hypotenuse every single time? It was always one, okay? So personally, I find the thing where they let the hypotenuse be one be easier, but if your hypotenuse isn't one, the way that you can find the sines and cosines, if you say end up in this quadrant with some kind of weird thing that's outside your unit circle, say this was one, that was two, and this was root three, how would you find the cosine of that, which would have been 30 degrees past 90, so we'll say it's 120. So what would you do with this side instead now? You'd make it negative 1 over 2. So the idea being is that cosine is the x, sine is the y, right? The only difference that you use with this definition is that you divide by the hypotenuse. Does that, you see what I'm saying there? You still take the x-coordinate from the triangle for the cosine part. If I'd asked you for sine, you take the y part. But the only additional thing is you have to divide by that hypotenuse. You can, oh, yeah, Sokotoa breaks. Yeah, I, I made this mistake myself. So if this was your angle and you want to find, yeah, because the thing is you want to find this angle that's the problem. Does that make sense? And you can't use Sokotoa anymore because if you have an angle that is bigger than 90, you don't have a triangle anymore. Does that make sense? Because Sokotoa applied to right triangles. So the reason to have the unit circle definition of sine and cosine is the first place is, is because Sokotoa only applies in quadrant number one. Does that make sense? You use Sokotoa to figure out that, okay, cosine can be defined as the x part and sine can be defined as the y part. But then after that, you can't use it anymore because it applies to triangles. And if they're right triangles, they can't have any, the other two angles can't be bigger than 90. And if you try to do Sokotoa with this little triangle that I drew, you're not going to get the right stuff. Because, like, if you did cosine with that little triangle that I drew, your opposite side is root 3, and your hypotenuse is 2. You see that? So, yeah, Sokotoa busts in those quadrants. Okay, all over the place, people are not here. Okay, suppose we have theta being an acute angle in quadrant 3, such that sine of theta is negative 4 sevenths. So I did this a little bit differently than the Alex teach you will show you, so I think it's a little bit easier. So. If we're in the unit circle, the hypotenuse is 1, and we have this little triangle. 
we know the sine, which is the y or the x, which is the y. So is it this side that's negative 4 sevenths, or is it this side that's negative 4 sevenths? Side 1 or side 2? 1. one. This is negative 4 sevenths. Does that make sense? Okay. So can you find the length of the other side? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pythagorean theorem. You take negative 4 sevenths, you square it, you will say we'll add, I don't know, we'll call it x squared equals 1. So it's uh, 16 over 49, right? Mm -hmm. Plus x squared. I know I'm going to need a common denominator, so I'm just going to make that 49 out of 49 right now. So if I take away 16 49ths from both sides, I get x squared is 33 49ths. Very good. And so x will equal root 33 over root 49, which is so 7. So this side is negative root 33 over 7. And that will be on the unit circle. Doing the Pythagorean theorem ensured that that will be so. Yes? So why can't you reduce it at that point right there, though? Why can't you? Why can't that be 11 over 13? What are we reducing? 16 49s? Oh, no, not that. Yeah, never mind. Okay, good. Oh, 33 49s. That was your thinking. Yeah, 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 definitely. Okay, great. So find the exact values of secant of theta and tangent of theta. So secant of theta is 1 over cosine of theta, right? And you now know what the cosine is. What is the cosine? Mm -hmm. So can I just say negative 7 over root 33 because that 1 over means reciprocate it? And that's the same thing as negative 7 times root 33 over 33. So there's the secant. Tangent of theta will take the sine and divide it by the cosine. So, hmm. so the sine is negative four-sevenths. The cosine is negative root 33 over 7, right? So what does that simplify to? Mm -hmm. Same thing as 4 root 33 over 33. Okay, that's one way. I'm going to do another, the next one a different way. You ready? Okay. So suppose you have theta, that's an angle in quadrant 3, where tangent is 4 thirds. So with sine it was easy. We could just say, okay, well, we know that's the y. With tangent it's a little bit tricky because you might have had denominators that went away. Does that make sense? They cancel. You know what they are. So in that case, it's actually a little bit easier to use the fact that if you had this triangle... Back here, tangent took the sine divided by the cosine or the y divided by the x. So remember that tangent of theta would equal sine theta over cosine theta. And if my sines and cosines have denominators, they're pretty much always the same and they're always canceling, right? So you can also define this as y over x where sine is the y coordinate. So this 4, that has to be that part. And the 3 has to be this part. And if it was in the unit circle, in reality, it was actually scaled down. But, you know, this is the unscaled down version. How could you figure out the other side? Why are you saying it goes, are you saying, you're saying it goes down 4? So, oh, so why, how, do I know it's, how do I know that it's down 4? Oh, and it's that quadrant, I see. Because they told you it was quadrant 3. If they hadn't told you it was quadrant 3, then you would be in quadrant 1. Okay. Does that make sense? It's a good question. Yeah. Okay. What's the other side? 
five. So using that information, find the value of cosine of theta. In that case, just use the definition where you take the x-coordinate divided by the hypotenuse. So what is the x-coordinate here? Mm -hmm. And because you went backwards, you'd have to take it to be negative. And then cosecant of theta will be 1 over sine of theta. So 1 over, what is the sine? Negative 4. Negative 4 fifths, yep. When your hypotenuse isn't 1, you've got to also account for that. And so this will give you negative 5 quarters. Let me just say a tiny bit to start the next one. I'm just going to go like a minute over, okay? So I know it's a little bit frustrating, but we'll, we'll just start. Because the fact that you've got cosy can't change it, just the tad. Okay, so the last. So start by saying cosy can't is what over what? One over sine. That's the same thing as saying sine of theta equals what? Negative two fifths. Does that make sense? And then can't you do it the exact same way we did the other one? Once you've got that, you know that, okay, well, if this is 1, what is that vertical side? That'd be 2 fifths or negative 2 fifths. And then you can Pythagorean theorem to find the other side. 2 fifths squared plus x squared equals 1. So 4 20 fifths plus x squared equals 1 x squared equals, that's mm -hmm, 21 over 25. Oh, except for square rooted, right? So that side is root 21 over 5. What would the tangent be from there? y over x, right? So sine over cosine, 2 over 5 over root 21 over 5. What's that going to make? 2 over root 21, which you could rationalize if you had to. How about the cosine? What will that equal in this case? Negative root 21 over 5. Okay, so that's it.